pray. Father God, we rejoice that we can gather, Lord, tonight just to continue to seek you, Lord. We just thank you uh, that you go before us, um, Lord, that, that you direct our steps, God. And we just worship you tonight. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us with an unfailing love, God. We fall short of every day, but we can trust, Lord, in you and the finished work of the cross. And we just love you for that. We love you just for taking care of us and leading us in our lives as we follow you. Help us to abide in you more and more every day. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just stand you out to worship. Come. Just stand you out before your God. One day, one day every time we'll confess to a God, one day every knee will bow, still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you down. Come, now is the time to worship. the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship come just as you are before your God come one day one day every time we'll confess to God one day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day, one day every time we'll confess to a God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Just as you are, come. Just as you are, come. Just as you are. I will delight in the law of the Lord. I will meditate day and night. Then like a tree firmly planted, I'll be grounded in your word. I will delight. I will delight in the law of the Lord. I will meditate day and night. Then like a tree firmly planted, I'll be Grounded in your word, blessed, blessed is the one who follows the way of the Lord. Blessed is the one. I will delight. I will delight in the law of the Lord. I will meditate day. Then like a tree firmly planted, I'll be grounded in your word. I will delight. I will delight in the law of the Lord. I will meditate day and night. Then like a tree firmly planted, I'll be grounded in your word. Blessed. 
My soul thirsts for the living God. My soul thirsts for you alone. My soul thirsts for the living God alone. My 
soul. My soul thirsts for the living God. My soul thirsts for you alone. My soul thirsts for the living God alone. Praise, praise. Lift your voice and raise, praise. Sing in your amazing grace to the living God, to the living God. My heart longs for the living God, my heart longs for you. Cry out. I cry out to the living God. I cry out to you alone. I cry out to the living God alone. Praise, praise. Lift your voice and raise, praise. Sing your amazing grace to the living God, to the living God. Why do you cast down, O oh my soul? Why do you down, O oh my soul? Place your open God, O oh my soul. I will be glad. Lift your voice and praise, praise, to sing your amazing grace to the living God, to the living God. Sing an amazing grace, thou sweet the sound, the Savior wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Sing an amazing grace, a sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Praise, praise. Praise, praise. Lift your voice and raise, praise. I sing your amazing grace to the living God. To the living God. Sing an amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Sing an amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see.
precious hope more turnips face toward you and give you peace more blessed Just do the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May his presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you. All around you and within you, he's with you, he's with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping, in rejoicing, he's for you, 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 he's for you. The Lord turned his face toward you and give you peace. ask that you would just uh, fill our hearts for more of you tonight, Lord. Give us your word, your life, Lord, and may we just apply it to our lives, Lord. We, we walk away from here tonight, Lord, just with something more from you that we could just um, apply it to our lives and Lord, just be doers of your word, not just hearers, but be doers, put it to action. We want to be about your business, Lord, as the days are short, so we just ask you to fill us tonight. We bless your name. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Go ahead and turn high. Say hi to somebody.
Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Calvary Chapel Running Springs. Um, I get to give you announcements tonight. It is quite a few, so buckle up. Okay, first thing, um, Lake Arrowhead Christian School, which is located in Twin Peaks uh, slash Sky Forest area, uh, is in need of coaches and assistants for their junior high and high school uh, athletic team. So some of the things they need, um, they're in need for volleyball coach for varsity, um, junior high baseball and softball, uh, girls basketball for varsity, girls basketball for junior high, and um, they are looking for a s coach for track and field. If you are interested in any of these positions, uh, you can uh, talk to me or call 909-337-3739. Um, anyway, if you are interested and you would like to know more about it, uh, you can talk to me and then I'll direct you to the right person afterwards. Also, um, Hume SoCal, uh, also no, well, formerly known as Green Valley Lake Christian Camp, is looking for a help um, and they are looking for help between now and June 10th or 11th. And they are just hoping that we can help them with um, manual labor mostly. And they are talking about um, just helping them with projects around the facilities <laughs> um, before their first summer camp starts. Um, if you are interested in helping them, uh, you can talk to Lisa Guffey and she can give you a little more details about that as well. Okay, also on this coming Sunday, there's going to be pro presenter um, volunteers needed. Steven is going to be putting on a training class for anyone that might be interested. So if you aren't sure, but you are thinking about it, just coming out, Steven would love to have you. Sound and video is included in that too. And sound and video is included in that too. Yes, so yeah, so sound and video is included in that and pro presenter. And if you're just interested in it, just come after second service and Stephen will point you in the right direction. He's excited for it. Uh, next thing, uh, the barbecue, uh, our next barbecue is going to be on June 15th, and that's going to be at 630. And don't just come over by, your by yourself, invite a friend. Um, also, tomorrow, Thursday, is Ladies Bible Study at 630 p.m., this Saturday will also be men's breakfast at 7.30, and Kevin is continuing with men of the Bible for that. And finally, Monday night, Bible study with the Tafoyas. Uh, we'll start back up on the book of Matthew. The Bible study starts at 7, but food and fellowship is at 6.30 p.m. Good evening. So I'm going to call the elders up because we're going to be praying out Rachel and her husband tonight. Um, and maybe Pastor Adam, you can fill me in a little more info on that. Um, here you are. You know, it is always a blessing and a curse <laughs> when, when somebody leaves the church. You know, they have been uh, uh, instrumental here at this church, uh, faithful followers. Uh, I have gotten to know them over the years. They've watched my beagle. <laughs> they should get extra blessing just for that. <laughs> However, um, they recently sold their house. Uh, They're going to be moving up to uh, Cheyenne in Wyoming. Uh, believe that the Lord has called them up there. So along those lines, uh, it, we would be remiss if we didn't pray them out and just you know, have God speed them on their incredible journey and adventure that lays ahead. So if everybody would please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we just want to lift up Jonathan and Rachel. Pray that you would be with them, that you would give them traveling mercies. Lord, you have instituted and allowed uh, just so many blessings in their lives. Lord, uh, the house is sold quickly. And Lord, I pray that just as easily 
uh, the move and everything would just come to fruition. Lord, pray that you would give them traveling mercies. Go before them, clear their paths. Lord, truly guide and direct them all the days of their lives. Know that they've always got a home here and Lord, that uh, they'll be missed. So Lord, please, I pray your blessing upon their marriage, upon each and every one of their children, and that you would continue to be by their side. Lord, just watching over, guiding and directing them. And Lord, that they would find a home in another, another amazing church uh, that you've got waiting for them up there in Wyoming. God's country. <laughs> God, you are so good. You are so blessed. Uh, and, and you bless us so abundantly. We can never thank you enough. Bring all these things before you. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I got to tell you, it's uh, it's pretty awesome to see uh, the spirit of the Lord moving in people, and how uh, when people leave, it's not something that's negative or bad, but it's something where the Lord is calling them out, and so it's always good to see that, uh, to see the Lord moving and the spirit moving in such a way that people from here are being sent out to different places to minister to different ac different capacities. So that's awesome to see um, tonight. Uh, we're going to be in Exodus 29. So Exodus 29. If you don't have a Bible, um, please raise your hand, and somebody will come by and uh, give you a Bible. If uh, you don't, if you don't have one of your own, you can keep that one. It's yours to keep. Um, but before we get into the Word tonight, let's start with some prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Um, everything that we do, you allow us to do. Everything that we can do, you enable us to do, Lord. And I just pray that as you continue to enable, continue to fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we may be um, sensitive to your spirit, Lord, that we may be sensitive to your voice, and that we may have hearts that just want to serve you, Lord, and want to walk in your ways, Lord, not because we're good, Lord, because, but because you're good, Lord. Not because we can, Lord, but rather because you took us out of our muck, out of our misery, and have, it, have given us life and life abundant, Lord. So tonight, Lord, as we go to chapter, through chapter 29 of Exodus, I just pray, Lord, that your spirit may fill us, that our hearts may be ready to receive what you have, not because it comes from my word, but from my mouth, but rather because it comes from you, Lord. Lord, hold back any words that are not from you and allow the heavens to open, Lord, and to gush out your, your spirit, Lord, in such a way that every heart here leaves refreshed, transformed, and, Lord, ready for what, 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 what we face ahead, Lord. Every single moment in this life, Lord, you have allowed us to live here is for a purpose, Lord. And so, Lord, I just pray that we may um, seek you in such a way that we may know your purpose and that we may become people of your word, a royal priesthood. So, Lord, thank you, and we just ask that you continue to minister, Lord. In your name, amen. How many of you can agree with me that there are just things in life that are a recipe for disaster, right? A recipe for disaster. And we can think of many things, but what comes to mind is uh, the uh, year, or a couple years that I got to teach uh, Spanish. And I say I got to because it was a blessing. Uh, it was uh, not something that I ever thought I'd be doing or um, that I wanted to do, but the Lord allowed me to teach high school Spanish. Um, and it was interesting because I had all levels from freshman all the way to senior. And uh, I always loved it when kids would ask me, Mr. Montoya, because that's what they would, ca would call me, Mr. Montoya, can, 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 can I just sit with that person over there? Right? And of course, I would let them because that's what you do. No, I wouldn't actually. Uh, the reason being because 
I knew it would be a recipe for disaster, not only for myself, but also for them. Um, and so um, uh, I, I found different creative ways to say yes while saying no to that. And uh, it, it was very fun and very interesting. But how many of you guys know and can also attest to this that in our spiritual walk and the spiritual world, there's also recipes for disaster, right? There's recipes for disaster. Um, when I was in El Salvador um, for about a year or so, I, I got the opportunity to evangelize a lot. Now, I'm not the type to be talking to everybody and anybody on the streets, but um, when there is an opportunity, I, I try to take a pr an advantage of that. And, and so when I was in El Salvador, we did a lot of evangelizing, and, and it, it uh, allowed me to get a little comfortable with it. And um, as I was there, um, and I would approach random people in malls and the streets and just all these different things, some of them, uh, when I would, uh, some of the first things I would ask is, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And uh, if we were to take it at face value, most of El Salvador knows Jesus. Most of El Salvador knows Jesus. And so they, they, they would say, yeah, I know Jesus. And so then I would begin to have these conversations with them and ask them questions to go deeper and, and only to find out that Jesus was just just a name. It was just a name. You see, and, and what I came to find out was that that's a recipe for disaster. To say I know Jesus without actually knowing Jesus, that's a recipe for disaster. But tonight, I didn't come here to talk about recipes for disaster. Because just like there is recipes for disasters, there's also recipes for consecration. You guys are like, wait, what? What's that? So, um, consecration is the act of making something sacred. Okay, the act of making something sacred. And to be sacred is to be set apart, to, be, to, to know God and to be known by God. That's what, that's what it means to be sacred. And so an example that I could also think about while I was in El Salvador was this young man. Um, so I got paired up with this one girl who, she was so bold for the faith. She would go up to anybody, didn't matter who they were, and just say, hey, do you want to know Jesus? And somehow, some way, I don't know if it was her prayer life or her fasting life or her time in the Word, but somehow, some way, something always came out of her conversations. And so I'm, I'm with her, I'm paired up with her, and the whole time I'm thinking, oh man, you know, we're going we're gonna to end up talking to some people that I'm not going to be really comfortable with. So she, she, she approaches this one, um, he was probably like 17, 18 or something like that. He's got his, uh, his straight hat backwards, and he's got baggy clothes, and, 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 and I'm thinking, well, why are we approaching this guy? He's obviously young. He's got better things going on, right? So we approach this guy, and uh, we start talking to him and everything. He's, and he's kind of like standoffish at first, and he says, I'm just waiting for my girlfriend. So we continue to talk to him, ask him if he knows Jesus. And, and, and as the conversation continued to uh, progress, he says this. He says, you know what? Today... This morning I woke up, and I was praying to the Lord. I was praying to Jesus. And I told them, I need an encounter with you. I need to be with you once again because I've been far away so long. And, 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 and as he begins to relay this to us, he begins to bawl, just cry and cry. Mind you, he's waiting for his girlfriend at the mall. So as he's crying, his girlfriend gets there, and, 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 and then he, beca he starts ministering to her. And so my point with that, my point with that is that knowing Jesus is not enough. Knowing or saying you know Jesus is not enough because that's a recipe for destruction, for disaster. See, the recipe for consecration doesn't always look like we think it's going to look. 
but there is a recipe for that. And tonight, as we go into Exodus 29, what we're going to see is that um, the Israelites, specifically Aaron and, and, and his, um, his generations to come, were called to be royal priests. Were called to be priests that were royal before God. But they had to go through a consecration process. I don't know if you guys know this. But Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, says that we are royal, a royal priesthood, chosen by God. And so in all of that, we are these priests that are to, to go through this process of consecration. And I, I want to start tonight with reading, actually, 1 Peter chapter 2. So if you guys go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to start there, and then we'll come back. So if you want to put your finger... Or if you have a bookmark on Exodus 29. So 1 Peter chapter 2. We're actually going to start in verse 4. And it's spe speaking about chosen people. And verse 4 says, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. The, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you, say I, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So we see here that we're chosen people, uh, royal priesthood but i don't know if you guys noticed that before the the previous verses talk about sacrifice talk about sacrifice yes we are a chosen people we are a priesthood we're all these things and a lot of times we focus on that but before that comes the sacrifice and so today as we go back to exodus 29 what we're going to see is that the Israelites were a chosen people. And they had priests who were chosen to be royal priests and to go before God for the people. But there had to be something given in return. And as we go through Exodus 29, which is a long chapter, we'll kind of go through it kind of fast. What I want you guys to notice is that all this happens around the altar, right? All this happens around the altar, and so now in our uh, modern Christianity, we have all these songs about the altar, come to the altar, and, uh, and we sing it, and we're like, yeah, the altar, and we think about this awesome place, the altar. But here, what we see is that the altar, the, what actually defines the altar, it's defined as the killing place, the killing place. So it's not this idea of just an altar, an elevated position, but rather is a place where it was violence, where there was blood, where there was burning of flesh, and all these things that you're going to see. And I think that for us is important to understand because what it really means is that when we go to the altar before God, it's not just to be filled. It's not just to be given the desires of our hearts, but rather that, that, that more and more of us may die that he may live in us. So let's 
start in uh, chapter 29, verse 1. By the way, the title for tonight's teaching is Recipe for Consecration. Recipe for Consecration. In verse tw- uh, chapter 29, verse 1 says, And this is what you shall do to them, to hollow them for ministering to me as priests. So basically, they're starting this off by saying, hey, this is what... This is the process that they have to go through to be consecrated, to be made sacred unto God and to have that connection with God. It says, take one young bull. So they go into the ingredients, what they need for this. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You shall make them of wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket with the bull and the two rams. So here what we see is really that the Lord is basically telling Moses, hey, these are the things that you need for this consecration. I'm going to tell you everything you need, and you just got to bring it with you. Okay? So then in verse 4 it says, And Aaron and his sons you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle. So notice where they're at. They're not going into the tabernacle. Why couldn't they go into the tabernacle? It's a holy, right? It was holy. And they were not holy. They were being consecrated. So they have to start somewhere, and it becomes a process. And so we see that they come to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall wash them with water. So we see here that they're at the door of the tabernacle, and they're going to be washed with water. Now, it doesn't say whether they were supposed to be naked or anything like that, but I don't know if you guys have ever gotten your feet washed, right? This feels uncomfortable, right? Like, if, especially if there's a lot of people washing or something. Hey, wait, anybody ever get their feet washed? Okay, some of you guys, great. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's kind of nicer to wash somebody else's feet because it's a little more serving. But, um, but getting your feet washed can be a little embarrassing, right? It can be a little, it bring a little humility. Imagine being completely washed from head to toe by somebody else. That brings humility, right? So the first thing that we see here is that Aaron, these priests, right, they're going to come to the door of the tabernacle, and before the people of Israel, they're going to be washed. And so it, brings, it, it talks about humility, and the humility it requires before you even enter into this process, right? Um, they're going to be washed with water. Um, and I don't know if you guys remember, but in, in, in the New Testament, we also see the baptisms and all these things that, that happen, right? It's kind of like a connection to this, like being washed with water. It doesn't mean that they're being completely cleansed, but it's a declaration. Hey, I, I'm, I'm going to humble myself and allow you to wash me that, uh, that, that, that I may go to the next step of this process. And so we see here that in verse 5 it says, Then you shall take the garment, put the tun- tunic on Aaron, and the rope of the ephod, the ephod, and the breastplate, and gird him with the intricately woven band of the ephod. You shall put the turban on his head, and put the holy crown on the turban, and then you shall take the anointing oil. Let's stop there. So notice that they have been washed. Now the Lord says, go ahead and put the holy garments on them. Remember, they've been working on these garments since uh, the, uh, in the previous chapters, putting them together and everything. The Lord gave people gifts so that they could put these things together, right? So not only does the Lord say they're going to be washed, but he says, now I'm going to dress them in holy garments. How many of you guys know that that's the Lord to us? How many of you guys know that the Lord doesn't just wash us? He doesn't make us clean only and leave us there, but rather he dresses us as royal priests with these royal um, turbans and everything, whatever it may be, but in a spiritual way, right? The Lord doesn't just leave us empty-handed. He dresses us. But then we see here that it says, You shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head, and anoint him. So um, anointing oil, you guys have seen anointing oil, and uh, usually pastors have it. I don't know where they get it from. They probably get it from this like well where they have to climb in there and I'm just kidding. I don't, it's probably just oil. It's probably he's laughing back there because <laughs> I'm making him look like Indiana Jones or something. <laughs> uh, it, it's just oil, but but we see here that he calls it anointing oil, and is there's a symbolism to that? 
and it's it's directly connected to the Holy Spirit. So anytime you see oil in the uh, in the Bible, it's going to be con- directly connected to the Holy Spirit. So he says that he's going to be anointed with oil. But notice this: it's not just an anointing. It's not just uh, usually you know we don't want to pour oil on somebody's head when we're praying over them, right? Just like pour it all over them and they walk out of here all greasy. Um, no, that's not what we want to do, right? Because it's just probably rude. <laughs> But here we see that he says, uh, pour it on his head and anoint him. So he's like, hey, just pour the whole thing on his head. Like drench him with it. Why? Because he says in this process, you're going to need the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but not just a little bit. You're going to pour it all on his head. You're going to need a lot of the Holy Spirit. And, and, And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but up to right now, what has Aaron and, or his sons, I don't know if they're here yet, but what has Aaron done so far? Nothing. He's done nothing, right? They washed him, they clothed him, now they're anointing him. And if you guys think about our walk with the Lord, that's us. There is nothing that we do. We, we convince ourselves that, yeah, we do it. Yeah, I did this, I did that. But I think sometimes the Holy Spirit just laughs and says, they think they did it, but I did it for them. I did it for them. Because in, in um, John 15, uh, when Jesus is talking about the vine, uh, that he is the vine and we are the branches, what he talks about is that without him, we can do nothing. Without him, we can do nothing. So what it really points to really is that without him, we can do nothing that's actually productive for the kingdom of God. That th- that's actually going to count for something, Right? And so we see here that it talks about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He says, you're going to fill them with your spirit. It makes me think about Pentecost and when the spirit came upon them and just all these people began to speak different tongues. And so continuing on in verse 8, it says, verse 8, it says, you, um, Then you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. Now his sons come into the picture. And you shall gird them with sashes. Aaron and his sons and put the hats on them. The priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. So you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. Notice this, that as Aaron is being washed, Aaron is being clothed, Aaron is being anointed, so are his his sons, right? His sons. And, And it doesn't say anything about the character of his sons, right? It doesn't say anything about their walk, how they're doing or anything like that. We see a lot about Aaron. But we don't see a lot about his family. But something that it does tell us is that there's a connection between the parent's heart, the parent's walk, the parent's willingness, and and the the sons and what their future looks like, right? Because he says they're going to be priests. They're going to be priests, and I'm going to put them through this process. And so we see here that this is the beginning of this process. And then continuing on, what we're going to see is three sacrifices. Do you guys remember what the ingredients were as far as uh, the animals? Oh, are you guys sleeping tonight? Okay, there was a bull, okay, and two rams, right? A bull and two rams. Why the bull first and then the rams? I have no idea. I have no idea, honestly. But we see here that the bull is going to be offered up first, okay? So uh, remember, the altar is not just this warm place where we go to see the seek the Lord or give everything to the Lord, but rather it is the killing place, right? The killing place. So we're about to perform these things here. Um, and then in verse 10 it says, you shall also have the bull brought before the tabernacle of meeting. You could just imagine the bull walking to the tabernacle thinking, where are we going? Right? And then it says, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands on the head of the bull. So notice the first thing that happens when the encounter between Aaron and this bull that's about to be sacrificed is that they put their hands on the head, the horns of the bull, or the head of the bull. Do you guys know why? Good, somebody's been reading commentaries. Yeah, it's a transference of sins. So basically it's him, the, the, the priest acknowledging Acknowledging that that's the sacrifice for his sins, right? If one says, 
I am not a sinner, can there be any sacrifice for that? Absolutely not. Right? If I can't acknowledge my sin, then Christ's sacrifice means nothing to it. For them, for the Israelites, it was the animals, the bulls, and all these other things, right? But for us, it's Christ. So the first step in this is that they acknowledge their sin. Acknowledge our sin in order for us to be able to walk in the newness of life, in this royal priesthood position that we have in Christ, the first thing that we need to do is acknowledge our sin. We need to know that we're sinners. Do you know that you're a sinner tonight? Because it's hard to admit sometimes. I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that. It's hard to admit. Because we all struggle with different sins. Not one person struggles with the same sin as somebody else. Obviously, there's commonalities, but we're all made different. And sometimes we may admit to half of our sins, right? Anybody ever pray and, God, forgive me for my sins? And the Spirit convicts you. What sin? I want you to declare it. I want you to be specific. Why? Because we're very vague with our with our with our confession of sin. Because it's easy to just say, oh, forgive me of my sins. But how hard is it to say, Lord, Jesus, I am struggling with this. Blank. Fill in the blank. How hard is that? It's very hard. Which is why I think this is the first step to priesthood. It's acknowledging our sin. And so he says here that he puts the hands on the head of the bull so that there's a transference, there's a acknowledgement of sin, but also an acknowledgement of sacrifice. And it says in verse 11, Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. You shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood beside the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails. So notice here, they put all the blood on the altar. I don't know if, if you guys ever think about this, but if we had to continue to do this, how tedious would it be? How tedious would it be? I mean, we have veggie burgers now, right? Would we even be able to, like, sacrifice vegetables? It'd be tedious, right? And so the... The Lord made the way through through his son, that sacrifice once and for all, because he knew that a bull was not enough. He knew that a, a ram was not enough. But we see here that it's still, for, for Israel, it's before Jesus Christ, and, and it shows the importance of acknowledging our sin, but also giving that sacrifice. And the next part is so important because he says, and take all the fat covers, the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them, and burn them on the altar. So the fat was like the most, the it was it was seen as the best part of the meat. I know now we're like, oh, I don't want my meat with fat, all this stuff. But back then, th this was the best part of the, of the meat. So we see that they burn on the altar, and in verse 14, notice what it says here. But the flesh of the bull, the what? The flesh of the bull with its skin and its offal you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. So we see here that when it comes to the flesh, it has no place on the altar. Not even as a sacrifice. When we give from the flesh, that means nothing to God. He says, take it out of the tabernacle, take it out of the holy place, and burn it out there, that when you come in here, there is no flesh. There's no flesh. Why? Does that mean that we're only spiritual beings? Absolutely not. Jesus Christ rose in the flesh. And one day we will be risen in the flesh, right? So what it means when you talk about the flesh, 
means there's no room for sin. The flesh is a representation of sin. There's no room for sin in the altar of God. Think about it. When we're in sin, it's so so hard to even give God a, 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 to give God a sacrifice. It's so hard to give God anything to God, really. When we are holding on to sin, it's as if there was a big gap between us and him. The gap that Jesus Christ already clo- breached, gapped, whatever, bridged. There you go. That's the word I'm looking for. Bridge. <laughs> I was at a loss for words there. Um, that Jesus Christ bridge is like we tear that bridge down and we're like, we still want to be with you, but we'll stand over here on this side of the bridge. And that's, that's not what he wants. So he says, Take the flesh out of the holy place, away from the altar, and burn it out there. That when you come in here, that when you come in here, you worship me in spirit and in truth. Worship me in spirit and in truth. It's Jesus telling uh, the woman at the well. Spirit and truth. And so we see that the first thing is acknowledging, but also giving that over to the Lord. It's a killing of our flesh that happens when we acknowledge our sin for what it is and our specific with it too. Again, it's so easy to be vague. But vague does not hit the nail on the head. It doesn't point out our sin. It just says, yeah, there's sin in here somewhere. That's what it says. And in verse 15, continuing on, what we see is that it's going to be the first ram that they're going to um, that they're going to sacrifice. So remember that the first was a bull, and it was meant as a sin offering so we can acknowledge our sin and give our flesh up. The second one, what we're going to see is, you shall also take one ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram, and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it sprinkle it all around on the altar. Then you shall cut the ram in pieces, wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces and with its head, and you shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. So we see here that the second, the ram, is not so much an offering for our sin, but rather it's just an offering to God. It's completely an offering to God. He's saying, this is my offering, this is my sacrifice, Take it all for you because I give you honor and glory, and all honor and glory goes to you. So after we are able to acknowledge our sin, then we give it to God freely. We give it to God freely. I don't know if you guys can attest to this, but when, when, we, are, when we give up our sin to the Lord, when we say, Lord, I, I'm struggling with this, this is what I'm struggling with, and, and just take it, what happens is that we're able to give to God freely anything. Why? Because there's no pride left in here. There's no jealousy left in here. There's no anger towards other people left in here. Why? Because he's done it all. He did it all for us. He doesn't say I did it for the population or I did it for anybody else. I did it for Gio. I did it for every single person personally. So we see here that uh, the, s- the first ram is actually an offering to God. It's just completely him. So it goes to us, to him, and then going on to the second ram. So the second ram, as you guys will see, is the longest one. The second ram, it talks about for a while, and a lot of things happens to, to this ram. So he's a very special ram. Um, but there's a reason for that, and I'll, uh, I'll touch on it right now. So in verse 19, it says, You shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands on the head of the ram. Then you shall kill the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and the tip of the right ear of his sons on the thumb of the right hand and on the big on and on the big toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar. So notice they're just putting it all on the extremities, right? On the right hand side of the extremities. We'll come back to that because that's going to be like the finishing points there. But uh, we'll come back to that. And in verse 21 it says, And you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him. And he and his garments shall be hallowed, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. 
verse 22. Also, you shall take the fat for of the ram, the fat tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, the two kidneys, and the fat on them, the right thigh, for it is a ram of consecration, right? This is a ram of consecration. This is the ram of consecration, right? So sin offering, burnt offering, and the ram of consecration. Verse 23, one loaf of bread and a cake made with oil and one water from the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the sons, and you shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. So then this, this lamb is part of a wave offering. And basically all it really was, a wave offering, what you're going to see is they're going to give uh, uh, the, the bread, the unleavened bread, which unleavened is a symbol of uh, sinless bread, basically. And, uh, and so it's, it's no without sin is really what it is. Um, so what we're going to see is that um, the wave, they're going to give them all this stuff to the, to the priest. The priests are going to take it. They're going to lift it up. They're going to wave it before the Lord. They're going to give it back, and then they're going to throw it into the fire and sacrifice it. So here in verse 24, did I go back? Maybe. And you should put all these in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons, and you shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. You shall receive them back from their hands and burn them on the altar as a burnt offering. Then, as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma before the Lord, it is an offering made by fire to the Lord. Then you shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. And from the ram of consecration, you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering, which is waved, and the thigh of the heave offering, which is raised of that which is for Aaron and of that which is for his sons. It shall be from the children of Israel for Aaron and his sons by a statute forever. For it is a heave of offering. It shall be a heave offering for the children of Israel from the sacrifices of their peace offerings. That is their heave offering to the Lord. So notice here, two main words to pay attention to is they're talking about heave offering and wave offering. Wave offering is basically the one I just told you about. They take everything, they wave it before the Lord and give it back. But then there's a heave offering. And what heave really means is to pull something up with strength. To pull something up with strength. So the way I uh, the way I kind of see this is basically that the heave offering is like they're pulling up with strength this wave offering. So it does take strength to do this, but it's not their strength. It's the strength of the Lord. It's the strength of the Lord that allows the, them to give this offering. Because remember, the, the they they're going through this process. And I don't know if you guys have ever been to a barbecue. Um, obviously, you guys have been to a barbecue. I don't know what kind of question that is. But we've been to a barbecue, right? You get to a barbecue, and usually you try not to eat before going to a barbecue. Why? Because there's going to be a lot of food, right? So then you get to the barbecue, and what's the first thing you smell? Barbecue. You smell the meat. You smell the food The food cooking. Depending on what kind of barbecue you go to, right? So uh, I just think about, about the priest, right? That's what's happening here. There's a barbecue going on. And they're giving the food, they're giving the food, and then they say, now you got to give it back because it's a wave offering. So it takes a lot to give it back. In a similar way, for us as believers in Christ who, who know that the Lord gives us all, we know that everything that we have, the Lord has given us. But how hard is it sometimes when the Lord asks for it back? How hard is it to say, yeah, here you go, Lord, take it back. Think about your most prized possession right now. Your most prized possession. And it could be a person. It could be material, whatever. If the Lord were to say, give it back to me right now, what would you do? Would you wave it and say, psych? Or would you actually give it to God? Give it to the Lord. Right? It's hard for us, as even as grown-ups, because children, you give them something and they want it for themselves. They don't want to share it with anybody. And then we're like, oh, you got to give it back. you got to give it to share with somebody. But then how hard is it for us? Because, you know, sometimes the Lord asks us to, gives us things so that we could bless someone else with them. So what are the things that if the Lord were to ask for you to give back, for us to give back, what are those things that we would uh, we struggle with giving back? Because if we believe that everything is given from the Lord, the Lord provides all, then everything that we have is the Lord's. 
my glasses, my shirt, my wife. That's a hard one, right? My spouse or children or whatever it may be. That's a hard one. But know that the time will come when the Lord will ask for that back. And where is our hearts? And the point I want to get to here with this, I know I've been talking a lot about this section here, is that when the Lord does ask for that back, um, this section here really, what it's talking about, is talking about oneness with God. It's talking about oneness with Him. This offering that is made is for no other reason than oneness with Him. So notice there was a sin offering. This was the, then there was the burnt offering. And now there's this offering that is about God and man. God and man. There's a sprinkling of the blood on the altar, but there's also the sprinkling on the, of the blood on the, on the person, on the priesthood. And so what we see, and what we're about to see even more right now in this section, is that what he wants is oneness. What he wants is oneness. And so in verse 29 it says, And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him, to be anointed in them and to be consecrated in them. That son, that son who becomes priest in his place shall be put them, shall put them on for seven days when he enters the tabernacle of meeting to minister in the holy place. Verse 31. And you shall take the ram of the consecration and boil its flesh in the holy place. Then Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They shall eat those things which the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them. But an outsider shall not eat them because they are holy. So notice here then they go into the eating part. So in many, many areas of the world, um, not so much in the United States actually, but in many areas of the world, uh, coming around the table and eating food is actually a way to commune, to fellowship. And we saw it in the, the New Testament and how um, how they how they came around to eat and, and they ate and stuff like that. But um, in a lot of parts of the world, it's still like that. Um, and so we see here that what it's really calling us to is intimacy with God. It's intimacy with Him. Why? Because when when they're eating, they're actually eating the sacrifice. They're eating what they have been have offered. And so they're ta- partaking of that meal with God. And so it's talking about oneness with God here. And uh, he, he, he says it's for consecration, but also for sanctification. Notice those, see, they throw in the word sanctification as well. Because, yeah, we're called to be made holy before God, but that process can only happen through sanctification, which means the process of us becoming holy or being made holy until the, the day when the Lord takes us with him. So um, what we see here is that there's this uh, there's communion over food. And then in verse 35 it says, Thus you shall do to Aaron his sons according to all I have commanded you. Seven days you shall consecrate them, and you shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. You shall clean, cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and, and the altar shall be most holy. Whatever it touches, the altar must be holy. So notice this here, that um, they, they are to do this seven days, so this process over and over. How exhausting would that be? To, do this, to be washed every single day and then go through the a uh, whole process every single day and give the, the bull. How many bulls and rams, right? <laughs> it's a one bull and two rams for every day. You do the math. Uh, but we see here that he says that whatever touches the altar, the place of killing, must be holy. So that's us. We're, we're, we're called to be holy. If we're, to, if we're to die to ourselves, die to our flesh, die to what God calls sin in our lives. And so in verse 38, and um, we'll go through this section pretty fast, and then we'll, I want to point out three things that stood out to me for this, for this. And it says in verse 38, now this is what you shall offer on the altar. So this is a daily offering. Two lambs of the first year, day by day continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of hin pressed oil and one-fourth of hin of wine as a drink offering. 
and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And you shall offer with it the grain offering and drink offering as in the morning for a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you. So notice here that this section here talks about, uh, takes it a little further. He says, yeah, those seven days of consecration are good, but there needs to be a daily offering, a daily sacrifice, because how many of you guys know that we need Jesus daily? We need the Lord daily. Days that, 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 because let's be honest, not every day is the same. Days that we go without spending time with the Lord, how are those days for you? Actually, let me ask this instead. How are those days for the people around you? Right? <laughs> not great, probably. Because with us, we try to convince ourselves, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, right? But then the whole time, the <laughs> people around us see it, right? That's just how it is. Um, and so we see that, that, that communing with the Lord, yeah, it's good to, 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 to be royal priest and to, to uh, eat with him and commune with him, but it's not just that one time. We didn't just receive Jesus and then walk away and never again see him, never again spend time with him, right? It's like getting married and then saying, okay, see you later, wife. We wouldn't do that, right? We would just be just roommates at that point. But we see here that it's a daily thing that, uh, and, and, and if you guys see, it's a sacrifice. Not, he's not saying, hey, it's just going to come easy. You know, it's going to take time. I think it's so cool because for them, it was like morning and evening, morning and evening. And why do you guys think that was? Why do you think it was? Is it enough with the morning? Like start your morning, right, fresh? I mean, it could be, right? But how awesome is to begin the day in the presence of the Lord and to end it in the presence of the Lord, Right? just makes everything kind of happy in between. Nothing matters in between because I begin my day with the Lord and end my day with the Lord. How awesome is that? And so here, um, I think the next few verses basically entail the whole picture of the whole chapter. And it says in verse 43, And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Notice this, the tabernacle sanctified by his glory, not by, any, by anything else. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. So he says, I'm going to dwell with them. I'm going to dwell with you. This is what he says. And in verse 46, it says, and they shall know that I am the Lord, their God. That I'm the Lord, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them, I am the Lord their God. Notice this. He says that they may know that I'm the Lord their God. Who what? So he didn't end it there that, you know, just that they may know me. He says who brought them out of Egypt. It's so important to, 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 to know who brought us of our, out, of our uh, out of our muck and out of our sin and out of our darkness. Because a lot of times we could pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I received Jesus. I'm saved. Right? But what it that is, is it's pride in us. Because we didn't do anything. And I can attest to you that I didn't do anything to, to receive Jesus. I didn't even know I had, I had Jesus in me until I knew I had Jesus in me. And that's a whole other story. I won't go there because uh, we're <laughs> up there. And so what we see is that, what we see is that there, there, there's, a, there's a recipe for disaster. And there's a recipe for consequence. And if we're here tonight and we've received Jesus Christ into our hearts, that's awesome. If we haven't, please do. But if we have, it doesn't end there. The Lord has a purpose for every single one of us. He has a purpose for every single one of us. And he wants to continue this process of consecration and sanctification. That we're made holy before him. But it only happens at the altar. To say more clearly, it only happens at the place of prayer. Where our flesh dies so that Christ can live. You see, this recipe, um, 
a more of a practical application in view, if we go back to verse 20, and I'm going to end here with these three points. If you go back to verse 20, it says, Then you should kill a ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear. Right? Put it on the tip of the right ear. Why the tip of the right ear? Why the tip of the right ear? It was symbolic so that they could listen to the voice of the Lord. So they could listen to the voice of the Lord. Then it says on the thumb and then on the thumb of the right hand. On the thumb. Everybody go like this. Thumb of your right hand. If you don't have a thumb, I'm sorry. Thumb of your right hand, right? Why the thumb of the right hand? So they could serve them. Right? So they could serve God. And then it says the big toe of the right foot. So they could walk in his path. You see, it's it's not enough to be consecrated as a royal priesthood and walk around like the Pharisees with our glorious robes and have no further work done in us. Why? Because the Lord wants to continue to show you his glory in your simple life. And by simple, I don't mean to offend anyone because I think we all live simple lives compared to what the Lord can do through them and through us. But the recipe for consecration, the recipe to be made sacred, one, is hear the voice of God. That's point number one. Hear the voice of God. Listen to the voice of God. Why? Because when we listen to the voice of God, we know where to go. If we can't listen to the voice of God, we're not going to know where we're supposed to go. Right? We're not going to know where we're supposed to go. When I don't listen to my wife, she gets mad at me because I have no idea what's going on. She, she, the Lord gave her a sense of, uh, of direction and, and scheduling and all that. I'm lost if I don't listen to my wife. Right? Secondly, that listening is so that we can know where we're going to best serve. Because we're to serve the Lord. We're to serve the Lord. Right? We're to serve the Lord. If, if we're not serving the Lord, then we're not listening. Because the Lord's not going to call us away from serving. He's always going to have us serve in some capacity because as long as we're on this earth, he has a purpose for us. It doesn't matter what age we are. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter. It's the Lord. And so we're to serve him. And that's what we're here on this earth to do. And finally, when we're listening to his voice, when we're serving him, engaging whichever ministry he has called us to, ministering to whoever it is, then we'll walk in his ways. We'll walk in his ways. You see, a lot of times we want to walk in his ways. Lord, show me the way. Lord, be a light to my path. But we're, we don't want to listen. We don't want to serve him. We just want to come and sit in church and listen to other people talk. And that's great and everything. But real growth is experienced when we listen to the Lord, when we serve him, and then we will walk in his ways. But it starts with listening to him. It starts with that. So the Israelites um, had these priests that would go before the Lord, and, and they had to go through this process of consecration, this recipe they had for consecration. We're called to something similar. But we no longer have to sacrifice bulls or rams because the sacrifice has been given once and for all. And Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. He said, it is finished. There's nothing that we have to do. But if we want to experience the glory of God to the full extent, then we need to continue to commune with him, fellowship with him, and allow him to work through us. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Because you brought us from darkness to light. You brought us to a place where our hearts could be completely surrendered to you, Lord. Where we could experience joy and joy to the fullest where we could experience your glory to a whole different level. Lord, I pray that we may just 
listen to that voice, Lord, that we're hearing. You speak to us in different ways, Lord, through different people, through different means. So I just pray, Lord, that tonight, Lord, if there's anybody here that's not listening to that voice, I just pray that they may give in, Lord, that their heart, the wall of their heart may just fall like the walls of Jericho, Lord, and that their heart may be completely given over to you, that they may experience joy and joy abundantly, Lord. Without you, we can do nothing, Lord. We take that verse so lightly. We take that verse to be something simple, Lord. But Lord, I just pray that tonight, Lord, we need to take it serious, Lord. Because without you, we can't do nothing for eternity or for this world, Lord. In our own strength, we can do nothing, Lord. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, but by your spirit, says Zechariah. And Lord, that your spirit may just fall on us in such a way that we may be an impact in our homes, in our communities, in our, in our country, Lord. There's so much going on in this world, Lord. And the enemy just wants to distract us, Lord. But Lord, that we may bow our knee to you, Lord. Bow our hearts to you, Lord. And continue that posture that you may use us, Lord, to change the world, Lord. To turn this world right side up, Lord. Because, Lord, you are God yesterday, today, and forever. And your power continues to be forever, Lord. So, Lord, that we may be disciples who make disciples. And that's all done through you, Lord, through your spirit. Open up our ears to hear, Lord. That we may serve you in such a way that it pleases you. And that we may walk in your ways in that newness of life full of joy, full of gladness, and full of compassion for the broken world that we have today. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, rather we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Thank you, rather we the Lord, we will wait upon our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not bench you. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong
night.